Okay, we're live, Katie. Here we are again. For a, for a night discussing winter backpacking. Yes. This is our this is our fourth Ask Us Anything event, and there might be some people out there that have have attended all four. But oh no, uh, isn't it our fifth? Is it our fifth? But there's yeah. I know one one individual that has made all five. Dan? That's my, my bud here, Luxor. Oh. <laughs> Consistently <laughs> in my desk chair. Yes. Every night. He attends all the meetings. Okay, so here we go, folks. So first, um, thank you very much for joining us. I mean, it's Thursday night, you probably have um, maybe dinner to eat or some time to spend with your family before we get ready to go to work tomorrow. So thank you for joining us. Uh, the presentation tonight will run for about 45 minutes like the other ones have, um, where it kind of feels like there's a natural end or where we feel like we've covered most of the topics. We'll just go ahead and close it out. Um, if you would like to participate in the chat, I guess, actually, let me rephrase that. We would love you to participate in this conversation. We, we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for you. So if you would like to participate and ask questions, then you the best thing to do is use the chat feature on the right side of the screen. And Katie or I will grab your questions. Mm -hmm. In fact, if someone wanted to even type a, a question in right now, that'd be great so we can make sure it's working. And then uh, finally, the last thing to mention before we get going is that uh, um, we are, Katie and I are just about done with um, forming our groups for the 2024 guided trips. Um, there is still some availability in Utah. Alaska is currently full, so you'd have to be on the wait list there. Um, California and Yellowstone uh, will go out on Monday. And West Virginia, we have some availability too. Mm -hmm. How's the weather in Boulder? What a, what a, <laughs> I guess the question, the chat is working. It the is. weather in Boulder today was was nothing right home about it. It's kind of kind of blustery and dreary and reminded me of what it's like to live back east. Mm -hmm. Katie, would you like to introduce our special guest? I would love to. Our special guest is Richard Forbes. He is one of our guides. He's based in Montana. Uh, Richard is a great person to have on for this talk. He has over 220 days of guiding experience in a wide range of mountain sports, um, rock climbing, backcountry skiing, mountaineering, mountain biking, photography, backpacking, of course. Um, in just the past few years, Richard has done uh, some interesting projects, including skiing or mountaineering across the isolation, Ptarmigan, Bailey, and Enchantments traverses in Washington. He's climbed and or skied five volcano the five volcanoes of Washington, and uh, he has visited 20 out of the 26 wilderness glaciers in Glacier National Park as part of a multi-year uh, storytelling project that he's doing, um, which if you have a chance to check out his website, is very fascinating, so I recommend it. So yeah, let's bring Richard in and dive into the questions. Hey, Richard. Hi, hey, Richard. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I kick it off? All right, I'm going to. So, <laughs> so let's, this is uh, a great opportunity for everyone to see the dynamic between Katie and they're like, all right, is, is Richard going to put his employee in her place or is he just going to let this run? And I'm going to let you take this. So go. Great. Okay. So I think it would be great to, to just start the conversation by framing like what do, some definitions. What do we mean by winter camping? So um, if uh, either of you or both of you could speak to like seasons, temperatures, snow coverage, and maybe if there are certain like experiences that really uh, define or encapsulate winter backpacking for you. Richard, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, totally. Great. I, I think I grew up in Pennsylvania in Southeast Pennsylvania, and I, I felt there was one understanding of winter, which is basically a lot of rain and maybe some snow. Um, and then I moved out to Colorado and Washington and now Montana. And I think I've really gained a, a perspective on the fact that winter is a wildly diverse thing. Um, it feels completely different in different regions. There's all sorts of different considerations about what snow might be present or not present, what the temperatures might be or might not be. Um, there's so many considerations on travel style based on the terrain. How steep is it? How not steep is it? Are there avalanche concerns? Are there not? Um, and I think that I'm saying all that not to necessarily be intimidating so much as it's really important to understand your region and the location that you're going to. It's quite easy to say winter backpacking. Uh, it doesn't mean that much, ultimately. It, it's a much bigger question around like, where are you going? What time of year? What are those conditions like? And, and learning how to ask those questions and look in the right places for, for where those answers might be. I think Andrew and I were chatting before the call and I think one of the things that really defines for me winter backpacking is snow. Um, 
if there is significant snow on the ground to a point where you can't easily travel without flotation or crampons or something like that. For me, that really defines how I look at winter backpacking. That being said, the places that I recreate are Montana and Washington primarily, and those are places that get huge amounts of snow. So looking in other places that might get less, but might have much colder temperatures, those aren't areas I'm as as versed in. Uh, I think another potential way to define winter camping is um, whether or not you're melting water uh, or melting snow for water, which increases the amount of difficulty uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got all sorts of concerns about how much fuel do I bring? Um, how much water do I need to consume? Um, and so, yeah, I think defining winter is a really important question. I can pass it off to Andrew to hear how he might define it. I don't think I would add too much to that. I think that's pretty good. Lot, as you said, a lot of variation. Growing up, I grew up in East Coast as well, and there are winters where, yeah, rain, rain and a little bit of snow. Um, even my parents, they live now north of Boston, and the, the winter there is totally different than the winter in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I've done winter trips along the Appalachians. Um, I've done winter trips in Colorado, and like, yeah, they are just done winter trips in Alaska. Totally, totally different, even though it's all kind of the same season. So I think for the listeners, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to offer some like universal advice, but I think you just need to put it in the context that we're going to give some regional answers to based on our own experiences. Great. Okay. So let's, if someone's new to winter backpacking, how do you recommend they start uh, by like, how do they, how do they choose a location? Like where do you recommend that they go? I've I'll heard. start, I'll start this. So one of the things about winter backpacking is that the risks are, <coughs> Are much higher like there's just this inherent risk of being outdoors when it's when the conditions are are like not in your favor so and you know, you may be just below freezing but maybe also you know 10 degrees 20 degrees below zero so i think that learning how to developing some some winter backpacking skills in a really like controlled environment is super useful so um one of the things that I would always do before my winter trips as I was I would start sleeping in my backyard to make sure that my sleeping bag was capable of of keeping me warm in the temperatures that I was expecting to see on my actual trip. Um, or I would you know, go for day hikes with my full kit just to kind of um, familiarize myself with my systems and where things were, because in the wintertime, you don't have you don't have that ability to kind of futz with your gear as much. Um, if anyone has ever read uh, the Jack London story, how to start a fire, um, you know that um, things can quickly go downhill in that environment. So day hikes, sleeping in your backyard, uh, setting up your shelter in your backyard, all in really controlled risk environments, I think is like like the first step. And then Richard, you can maybe follow up with some like more exotic locations for winter backpacking and camping. Yeah, I think one of the things that is so interesting, I don't know where all of you are from, but but your experience of winter is so diversely different from each other and from my own maybe. And, and I think I'm really deeply privileged in that I've, I've lived in mountain regions for the last 13 years now by choice. Uh, I really need to be in these landscapes. And, and as a result, I have really easy access to pretty rugged conditions really quickly. Um, I'm in Missoula, Montana right now. And within a day, I could get very, very deep into some pretty snowy situations. Um, and so I guess framing out like how you choose locations, like I love what Andrew said. And I think, first of all, you should really be prioritizing day trips because as soon as you add that overnight issue, uh, it becomes a whole pile of stuff. So if you're not comfortable in your region, exploring whatever winter you've got around you, it is not the time to add overnight yet. If you're looking to get to a more exotic region, like let's say the Cascades, I know the Cascades really well. Again, you really should not be adding overnight in without having a fair amount of day tripping experience. So that would look like snowshoeing experience, potentially backcountry skiing experience. And these are single day adventures. Um, as that becomes more comfortable and you understand the suite of skills that are required for that, that's when you might begin to consider adding on that overnight component. Um, but as Andrew said, like the, the capacity to get yourself into trouble is much higher in the winter. And so being as close to home as you start to explore this is really going to help because you want to avoid this feeling of sunk costs that somehow you've put so much money into something that you can't afford not to try it. And that, especially in the winter, can get you in some pretty hairy situations. So I would say the closer to home that you can be, 
the easier you can bail, the better experience you're going to have. And the more you can bail and decide you want to learn something else before you go back, that's going to really help keep things safe. And can, we all, can we come up with a list of like the classic like winter backpacking locations? Like I would say like, like winter in Yellowstone just strikes me as like, like a quintessential place to experience, to go to a winter backpacking. Cause it's, it's, you're not dealing with avalanche train. It's consistent winter, amazing wildlife, thermal features in the winter. Like what other locations would you, would you guys add to that list? Like I would say like in Colorado, I actually think that the win the classic winter experiences is, is hot trips. <laughs> but, I was thinking about hot trips. Yeah, they're hot trips, but that's yeah. not like, there's no, it's not what we're uh, talking about. Yeah. It's like, there's missing a, a very important, um, camping element there. Yeah. I would say, I mean, again, with my background with Cascades, I would say if we're talking about, I'm going to make things a little confusing for a sec. I'm all, I'm talking about snow here. There is a huge user group in Washington and Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest in general that are getting out on serious snow objectives in the springtime, which is there's lots of snow everywhere. The weather's a little bit more settled though. And folks are doing things um, like the big volcanoes. Um, or they're doing traverses. And I, I feel like in the areas that I spend time, that is very, very classic thing. People are doing single day trips and then moving into something like Mount Adams, which generally requires a camp at around 8,000 feet on lunch counter. Um, and, and for my region, that is very, very classic. Katie, you want to add one? No, okay. I don't. <laughs> Another one I would add in this, you start like you've seen some guys do this in recent years. It's these like, it's these high Sierra ski traverses oh, in like mm -hmm. late March, April ish. Those are, um, okay, let's jump, let's move. We have actually have a couple of questions <coughs> that I think we, yeah. that I think we can answer. Okay. Do you want to jump oh. into the chat first mm -hmm. or integrate those later? Okay. Um, so Matt Bildis asked Andrew or all, what is the biggest mistake you have made winter backpacking? <laughs> I have one, not bringing insulated pants on my first winter backpacking trip. Because in 2004, like insulated pants almost weren't a thing. Sure. They, insulated pants would have been really hard to find in 2004. I'm going to go a completely different direction with my answer. If you, if it was, were you going still? Nope. Done. Um, I think it was not trying. I was super, super intimidated by this stuff. Um, I was in Colorado for five years and basically did nothing in the winter because I was really intimidated by day trips. And then I was really intimidated, completely intimidated by the idea of spending time out overnight. And I got to Washington where, I don't know, I think it worked a little bit easier. I had more sportive community as well to get into it. But I realized as soon as I started like, oh, this is totally doable. Like, is it uncomfortable at times? Yeah, but I went through the day trips got really comfortable with those, started doing the overnights. It was like, oh, we're good. I think that was the biggest mistake. I, I just waited too long. Okay. Uh, Robert asks, so Richard, how do you stay hydrated? It's because you were talking about melting snow. Yeah, Thoughts on totally. Like hydrating. Oh, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> I think ideally you don't deal with this as a problem. I spend a lot of time in the Cascades doing multi-day traverses in the spring and I am really doing what I can to get the season right and my camp locations right so that there is some type of melting water around. Um, and I would say that begins to be a factor depending on where you're at and what the snowpack's like. In Washington, at least in May, you can generally find some melting water somewhere as long as your camp's not in the middle of nowhere away from any rocks. Um, but midwinter, how do I stay hydrated? You, you have this horrible uh, tradition that you begin uh, every night. You get into camp, you spend about an hour making camp. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then <laughs> when you're ready to collapse, you then spend two hours um, melting water. And I would say that is true. That's a real number. Um, I would say two hours every night uh, with a jet boil, ideally the biggest pot you've got. and I think typically we were making between eight and 10 liters a night for the next, for, for dinner that night, breakfast the next morning, and then travel through the next day. Um, and that's for two people uh, on these big traverses that I've been playing with recently. Um, so it's really just how do you get the water and you just melt it and uh, 
it's really important. There's certain ways to do it. Definitely look up how to do it so you don't melt your stove. Um, if you don't put any water in there, it, it gets pretty messy. So there needs to be a little bit of starter water. Then you melt whatever snow you've got near you. And um, I find that I don't consume as much water while traveling during the day as I might in the summer. So I typically expect around two to two and a half liters a day of travel. It's for six to eight hours of, of skiing or something like that. I'm mostly on skis in the winter. Um, and then as soon as you get to camp, you do it again. It's a great party. Do you have a preferred stove for melting snow or fuel type? I would take this on. So I think it depends on where you are. So I've used, um, all things being equal, your canister stoves are going to be better. They're just easier to operate. Uh, they're less, uh, less futzing. Um, they don't have the mess, but the, the white gas stoves are going to be like your, um, it's going to be more versatile kit. So as an example, like if I were to go, if I were to go winter backpacking here in Colorado, um, when I, and I needed to melt snow, I would bring, which is probably going to be for a couple of nights, I would bring a, a canister stove with me. But during my big Alaska trip, when I was skiing like, through the Arctic area, I was just, I was getting, uh, I was actually using unleaded gasoline that I could get in the native villages and using that on a whisper light international stove, which normally would burn white gas. So. And, okay. and I'm, I'm a big fan of the reactor, the MSR yeah. reactor, oh. because those things crank out heat yeah. and you can actually get pr like 1.7 liter pots for them, yeah. which you're trying to just get the biggest pot possible. So you have to do the least amount of refilling it because I've, I've used a 0.9 liter uh, jet boil and, and you're just constantly refilling the thing. And it's just, it's just annoying. So there's a trick here, though. So if you are using a canister stove, Richard, what happens in the winter time to the, the fuel pressure? In your yeah, so it gets oil? cold. And so you got to sit it in a little bit of mildly lukewarm water, which creates a heat sink. So you want a little bowl that can go around your fuel canister. Otherwise, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because your stove won't work. Yeah, basically, the, the uh, you know, in the process of it, boiling the gas off, it would get cold anyway, but then it's in such a cold environment that it will get to the point where there's no gas coming out of your, out of your stove. Yeah. Um, you could also like the quick fix for that. If you don't, if um, it doesn't, doesn't work for a real long period of time, but if you're in a cold environment and you just need to make like some hot water, you can just bring, bring your canister stove like into your jacket and just warm up the canister that way. And that usually is good. Or you can put your hands on it. No, that's that's horrible. Horrible. Like, yeah. and then they go numb. It's great. Yeah. I've done it to try to get that final little bit of boil done. There's a couple of questions, speaking of water, about uh, water treatment in the winter. So your methods for water treatment in the winter, Bill asks, also, do you boil to purify? Ted says, or do you consider non-yellow snow snake? Smiley face. Yeah. I've never purified my winter water of you, Richard. Never, never even thought of it. It's, it's such a, yeah. As soon as it gets to water stage and not not cold anymore, then I just drink it. Um, the one thing that um, I would recommend that you do with winter water, because because boiling water kind of the water kind of has a like a boiled snow smell and taste to it. So I liked putting I would just uh, throw a tea bag in like all of my water bottles and just let that seep all day, and that made a big difference in just the the appetizing nature of of those fluids. There's some other good questions here related to this like food and water thing that I think are worth taking on. Mm -hmm. And I can almost probably answer them pretty quickly. So um, someone asks, uh, do you need to think about increased caloric intake? And this is like counterintuitive because you would think like colder weather and you read about these people who are in these cold environments and how much food that they need to eat. But I actually find that my appetite goes down in the wintertime because the days are so much shorter. So in a, in a summertime situation, I'm, I'm hiking for like 12, 14, 15 hours a day. In the winter time, you're doing like eight to ten, so it's a, actually a pretty big drop in in caloric um, output. But you need to reserve some calories for the middle of the night because you're spending so much more time in camp. So, like, have a Snickers bar in your parka that you can chew on at midnight just to kind of keep some stove and the fuel or some some fuel in the engine, um, so that way you don't get cold. Anything you want to say about, uh, let's just talk about like nutrition, menu planning changes, anything you do differently food wise in the winter right now, anything you want to add to that, Richard? I, I changed it a little bit based on what Andrew just said, which is 
I'm typically doing these big springtime traverses where I'm getting up at four in the morning and going until around noon or one when the snowpack starts to get movie and starts to get sketchy. Um, and then I sit in camp from two until seven or eight or nine, depending on when the sun goes down. And so I am just lying there in the sun eating all my food. <laughs> and so I just have to have lots of snack food because I'm not moving much, but I'm just so hungry all the time. It's boring. <laughs> and so, and so I would say I'm not like, so that I don't, I'm not necessarily prioritizing at that point, like, like s snack bars so much as I'm prioritizing chips all the time. Also a ton of like noon or some other water additive that I can get salts back in because like, I'm, I'm just hanging out in the afternoon for hours and hours and hours and I am so hungry. <laughs> so, so that, that's my big thing. I, I wouldn't say I changed my, like the food that I eat too dramatically for the temperatures that I do, which rarely get below 20. Um, the, the cascades in the springtime are typically between 20 and 50, 40 degrees probably. And, and that's pretty manageable. It's much different than, than Andrew's experience. Yeah. I will add some, you actually do definitely need to make some food changes if you're going to be in, in cold temperatures. So like something like a cliff bar, total non-starter in the winter time. Like, like it's like, it's like a hockey puck. You need to like thaw it in your mouth and then maybe you can kind of like pull some pieces off of it and then you chew it like a really, like a, a stale Tootsie roll for a while. So yeah, like um, I think the recommendation my, and like anything that has a, a lot of, uh, so like um, anything that's kind of sugary and like like Brown rubbery rice, is yeah. going to get hard. Um, so my recommendation, if you are going to be winter camping, take all your food and like that you think you're going to bring and throw it in a freezer and like see if you can chew on it when you take it out. So like things that do work well, um, uh, any kind of chips work well, um, uh, nuts work well, although interestingly, uh, uh, it's pecans. Pecans get like oddly like crystallized in really cold weather. It's a totally different texture in really cold weather. So uh, those nuts. And then there are some energy. There are some energy bars that that work well in winter time, but Cliff Bar is not one of them. Some of the protein bars are a little bit are a little bit better. It's like a Cliff Builder bar is better than like your standard Cliff Bar. Definitely test it out. Um, no, um, no dried fruit usually because it gets um, basically like freezes with the water content in it. Uh, beef jerky is fine. Great. Yep. Okay, let's move on to gear considerations. So for winter backpacking, um, can you, either of you, both of you speak to some specific uh, gear changes that you might make? And then there's also a question about contrasting uh, snowshoes versus skis and a backpack versus a polk sled. Hey, before we get started, Richard, can you can you tell everyone what your what your roommate is making for dinner in the background? Sorry, is it loud? <laughs> I can ask her to stop. <laughs> it's not that bad. We just want to okay. know what's for dinner. I don't know what's for dinner. Okay. She's definitely thinking oh, around. So sorry. Is it making she says she's much, sorry. Is it making too much? You're okay. okay. Um, yeah, I can talk about gear considerations. Um, this is, this is a really big one and it completely depends on where you're going to be. Um, and so I would say the biggest thing that I am thinking about in the areas I am is whether or not avalanches are a concern or not. Uh, so that is basically means there is a lot of snow uh, and there's also avalanche terrain, which means it's steeper than 30 degrees roughly. Um, and if I'm moving through avalanche terrain, I'm going to be bringing a beacon shovel probe, I'll also likely bring a snow saw. Um, and I'll also likely bring radios. Um, I like radios when I'm traveling in the winter, um, because you can allow it to separate out and still be able to communicate. Um, so that is for avalanche prone snow. Um, if the, I'm expecting the snow to be really icy, I might add on to that crampons, um, or like metal grabbers that go on your feet. Um, I might add an ice axe as well. Um, something that can help me both hold on to the snow by like plunging it into the snow, or if I fall can stop me from sliding down an icy slope. And then I also would consider bringing a rope. Um, and I would consider that if I was going to be on really steep snow or if I was going to be traveling across glaciers with crevasses and things like that. Um, when we get into glaciers, there's a whole nother pile of stuff, which we don't need to go into right now. Um, but I would say 
beyond that, there's a lot of like hyper specific stuff. If you're skiing, if you're snowshoeing, um, to speak briefly on that, um, if there's a lot of soft snow, you're going to need flotation. Um, and what that means is that you're going to sink potentially neck head deeper than you are if it's really light and fluffy and like you might have in Colorado. And so you need something to keep you from falling all the way through the snowpack. So snowshoes are amazing. I've done a lot of snowshoeing. I've also done snowshoe guiding. Um, they're really easy. It's as simple as, um, we, we say there's a 12 step program to learning how to snow, snowshoe, which is, uh, walk forward 12 steps and you, you figured it out. Um, it's not hard. Uh, and it's an incredibly, um, cost effective as well. I'd say for some of the more ultralight snowshoes you might get up into 300 dollar range but for good ones for almost everybody you're looking at 150 bucks also need some poles that's it backcountry skiing is a whole pile of money and gear and complexity you also need to know how to mm -hmm. ski and i would say if you're looking at getting a backcountry ski set up new you're looking at 1500 to 2000 dollars. so there's a huge difference between backcountry skiing and snowshoeing so i would encourage anybody who's on the fence um go try snowshoeing see how that feels uh, it's a lot more effective for going up steep slopes as well. Um, but if you are a skier like me, um, it's a wonderful way to move across the landscape, but that's going to take a lot of time to get to the point that you would feel comfortable moving across slopes that you could simply walk across uh, with snowshoes on day one. Can we um, talk a little bit about pros and so snowshoes, snowshoes versus skis? So we would describe skis as having a, a higher, uh, like a higher skill requirement. They're going to be more expensive to access. <laughs> Um, they're faster, um, but they're going to be less nimble than snowshoes. So snowshoes are kind of like the opposite. So like I, I think it, I think a really good use case for snowshoes is in uh, uh, tight forested trails where there's quite a bit of up and down. So I'm thinking of like climbing New Hampshire's White Mountains in the winter. Like I would want snowshoes, but um, like big open either big open alpine areas or or flatter areas um even if they're forested skis are going to be the way to go and within also, ski, oh, sorry within skis there's also like you know richard's kind of talking about like alpine touring skis so it's like you're like you know rando racing style ski but there's this whole other category of like kind of like your tr more traditional backcountry ski with with uh fish scales and it's a pretty narrow a pretty narrow widths and you could go like old school Nordic with like leather boots and three pin telemark bindings. And the ski world is its own thing. That's like people that's this, when you start getting into skiing, it's like getting into biking where it's so much going on there. Yes. Okay. I think this, so this, I think, um, is still on the topic of gear, but uh, specifically let's talk about sleeping like warm and dry. We had several questions about that. I'm going to pull from the chat first. Um, let's, I think this is a, a sleep, this is definitely a sleep related question. Um, this is definitely for you too. What's your favorite pee bottle? Ask Hunter Hall. Any, any bottle. Okay. I do, uh, Richard, do you use a pee bottle? Mm -hmm. You do? Okay. Yeah, collapsible analgene. Like 32 ounce. Collapsible analgene. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, like a, uh, a right, right, right. Like a bladder? Kind of like the platypus. Yeah, wild. but it's wide mouth. But it's a wide, wide mouth. mouth is yeah. essential. Yeah. yeah. Chris asks, do you have um, perspective on closed cell pad on top uh, or below your inflatable high R pad, high R value pad? I personally use it. Uh, always, um, I bring I bring the the close cell pad and I put it underneath my my Xtherm. Um, I do that for two reasons. One is I, um, as I said, spend an unbelievable amount of time just sitting around in camp, and that is all on my close cell pad. I have a Z rest. I love it. Um, it also just makes it comfortable to sit on the snow and just throw it on rocks. I can do whatever I want with it. I'm not concerned about it. And in the very unfortunate situation where my Xtherm might pop, I it's fine. I have a backup. It also just makes it a lot more comfortable. Um, so I'm a really strong believer in bringing that along. It's just as a backup, if nothing else, but I end up using it constantly. Yep. I was second that. Bad. Definitely. You want a close cell phone pad in the wintertime for all the Richards, for all the reasons you, that Richard mentioned. And then I actually, on my big trips, I've actually just gone with just a straight close cell phone pad, no inflatable. And I know that the R values on the closed cell phone pads are not are like nowhere close to the R values on the 
on the inflatable pads, but they seem to be fine. So there's some, I remember talking to MSR when, when those, when that R value test came out, like the sort of that, at that advertised test. And they were saying that because of the way the test is done, that closed cell phone pads don't test as high as they actually perform in the field. I mean, you know, I've slept multiple nights, 20 degrees below zero on a, what back in the day was like, it was a ridge rest so light. That's crazy to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Young and dumb. <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple other questions about uh, sleeping warm. So one, one that came from the online forum was some sources recommend layering a synthetic quilt on top of a down quilt in order to allow moisture to pass through the down into synthetic into the synthetic layer. Have you used this technique? And if so, does your down layer really feel less damp? If you don't use this te technique, what do you do? Yeah, I could. Richard, do you have anything to add on this one? I have other thoughts that are related, but I'd like to hear what you think. Yeah, so I think it, that approach to me just seems like you're delaying the, you're you're maybe um, reducing the problem, but you're not actually solving it. So the the solution to to moisture management and winter conditions is using vapor barrier liners. So a vapor barrier liner is going to be it's a you're going to have a, a normal base layer shirt or and pants. Um, so like a pair of like imagine like running tights on bottom and some like, say like a mid layer on top. And then for gloves, you would have like some liner gloves. And then your next layer is going to be a non-breathable shell. Um, and like, when I say non-breathable, I'm talking like tent fabric, non-breathable. This isn't like Gore-Tex, which isn't really that breathable, but like that's not, like that actually isn't still too breathable. So then that's your vapor barrier liner. And what that, that, that vapor barrier liner does a couple of things. Um, one is that it, it's a significantly warmer layer because you don't have any evaporative heat loss. So like you feel a lot warmer with, with those vapor barrier liners than you would in some breathable garment. The other thing that the vapor barrier liners do is that they prevent moisture from moving um, through like off your body um, and getting into your outer layers. And once moisture gets into your outer layers, you kind of don't have enough warmth to push that moisture all the way through that layer to get to the atmosphere, to like the outer atmosphere where it can then dry. So imagine sleeping in your, in your, in a sleeping bag for say, you know, nine, 10 hours and all night you're just sort of like slowly sweating and all that moisture just ends up in your down. And because the dew point is inside your sleeping bag, you and your sleeping bag gets soaked every night. It gets soaked. So the solution is vapor barrier liners. Um, it's sort of a technology that's, it's, the only thing about vapor barrier liners is because so few people, people use them, there are very few manufacturers that make them, but they are like a game changing piece of gear in the winter time. Hands for, for your gloves, like the best gloves I've ever used are the vapor barrier or the uh, RBH Designs vapor mitt gloves. And then RBH Designs also makes um, some shell jackets, basically like a wind shell and some pants that work really well too. And I just want to be clear, like when we're talking about all this, we're talking about a really particular type of camping at a really particular temperature. And so when we're talking about camping on snow or winter camping, there are going to be places that do get sun and that you can dry things out during the day. And, and most of what I'm doing, I can dry things out in the day. And that's, again, like late winter, early spring in, in Washington. I'm going at times when I know I'll be able to dry stuff. And therefore, if it gets wet, it is really not the biggest deal for me. I think the other thing that for me at least contributes to um, a wet sleeping bag is not having the right type of shelter or not having a big enough shelter. So if you're up against the edges of your shelter, there's no way you're getting around it. Everything's going to get wet. Condensation is going to build up on the walls. It's going to get on that sleeping bag, especially the, the foot uh, box, and it's going to soak through. Um, and that is reliably an issue for me. I sleep in a four man tent with two people and that is the smallest tent that I would go with for, for two people. Um, trying to stay away from those walls as much as possible. And that plus camping in areas that get enough sun that I can dry stuff is really important for me personally. Let's, let's, sure. let's dive a little bit deeper on that. Cause I think that's really important. So Richard, what you're saying is so f you're in the winter time, you're using a four person tent for two people. Yeah. Yeah, and with the idea being that you're giving yourself lots of room to both spread out your gear to like live in there, yeah. um, and then also just make sure that you're not touching those sidewalls. Um, is do we 
I'd be interested to hear your opinion. Do you think that um, ventilating your shelter at night is a good enough solution to kind of like getting that moisture out of your out of your shelter? No, because I just get caught in storms so much that I can't. I, I, yeah, I would I would say I lock that thing down pretty tight. Um, and I'm I'm using a, a, a four person tarp typically, like a mirror a, a pyramid tent. Um, so it's it's huge, and I'm building snow walls around it for the most part to keep uh, spin drift out and other like try not to get whipped around in there too much. And and so ventilation is not a concern of mine. I am much more concerned with getting spin drifted and everything getting soaked. Spin drift being really fine scale snow that gets blown along in the wind and gets itself shoved in anywhere that there's an opportunity. Yeah. And in addition to that too, and like, even if it is a calm night or if, it, if you are, don't have like a spin drift issue, then it's going to be a calm night. And then just the moisture from you, like being in there is going to put, put, put moisture on that inside wall. Can we, can we go a little bit more about shelters and like talk about yes. pitching them? It's so like, Richard, what's your preferred way of pitching your shelter on snow? Can yeah, back so a little more and actually like do campsite selection and then shelter pitching. Sure. We I think like, that makes sense. So you were talking about building like snow walls around it and idea. Yeah. Yeah. So to back way out. Um, and again, I'm just talking from a really particular perspective, which is um, in the Cascades or in Montana in areas that are avalanche prone. So my first concern is putting the tent somewhere it can't get avalanched. And that actually turns out to be a little complicated because I'm not going to put it in an avalanche chute, but also avalanches run. So they, they go downhill and they go a certain amount based on how big they are. Um, there's a whole fascinating thing called alpha angles that you can look up that basically will let you know if the area you're in can be avalanched by a slope that's above you. But that is essential. Um, people have definitely been killed by putting campsites in avalanche zones. Um, after that, you're thinking about exposure to weather. So how high up are you? Are you on top of a ridge line? Are you camping in a saddle where weather might kind of get whipped through? Oftentimes I am camping in saddles because that's the only place to sleep. I don't, sometimes I'll dig in on the side of a glacier out of the saddle, but that's a whole another pile of problems. Um, so really just kind of how exposed am I, how exposed do I have to be, how protected can I be from wind? Um, I'm also thinking about, um, water access. That's like absolutely essential. If there's any way that I can get anywhere near wa running water, I'm going to do it. And I don't care because that's going to save me two hours of melting my snow. So that's such a big priority. Um, so I would say those are the big things I'm really thinking about, um, avalanches, water availability. Um, also if I'm in areas where I think that storms are going to blow snow and start to drift up, I'd like to avoid those as well. Um, so like things like wind lips in, in, in snow banks can seem like great places to camp underneath because they look sheltered, but that's actually where all of the snow is going to get blown into. Um, so really trying to stay away from areas like that, um, are my big concerns. And then what about, uh, so once you've selected a good place to the, where you want to camp, how do you set up your campsite? And then Andrew had asked pitching your tent, like yeah, considerations so, for that. Yeah. So I, um, <laughs> it takes an hour more or less 45 minutes to an hour. Um, because again, I'm using a four person pyramid tent for the most part, but the, pro the it's the same either way. You can't just put a, a tent on snow and then jump in and sleep in it. Um, the problem is, most of the time um, that snow is soft uh, where I'm at. And so what you need to do first is to take your skis or your snowshoes or whatever flotation device you have and stamp out a flat platform. But one of the interesting things about snow and if you've spent time with it, you know, when you take it and you ball it up into a snowball and you push it together really hard, it stays that shape. It's called work hardening. And so often what we're trying to do in these platform building things is to work harden the snow by stomping on it first with a big, thing like a snowshoe or a, a ski and so i'll stomp out this big platform with my skis um, i'll try to get it as flat as possible because you're going to be staying there all night um, so it's really worth putting some time in to make sure you're going to get a good night's sleep um, leveling it out wherever possible and then after that take off the skis or the flotation and stomp it down with your boots pretty aggressively uh, again just trying to get it as flat as possible and as hard as possible um, and really what you're trying to do there is just harden that snow so that when you sleep on it, you don't sink into it. Um, after that, 
depending on how glitzy of a camp you want, you can take your snow saw and you can actually dig down into the snow. It helps for it to be hard. And so you can use your shovel and for your snow saw to, um, to carve out an, like an internal structure into the snow so that your pyramid is sitting on top, but underneath you've got this like really great, like, like kitchen space. You can build bunks into the snow and, um, that process would take hours, two hours from getting to camp and then building all that out. But if you're going to be base camping, it's really, really nice to have that. Um, most of the time I'm moving on after a single night. So I just flatten it out. Um, then I get, I make sure that the, the space is big enough for my pyramid tent. I attach the four corners, um, using my skis typically, um, because there's probably anywhere from, two to six meters of snow in the areas that I'm typically recreating. So I jam that, that ski down and that actually holds my, um, my tent corners in place. Um, if you don't have skis, uh, there's a lot of different things you can use. There's thing called snow, snow flukes that help grab onto the snow. Another trick is that you just take, um, uh, a, like a, what is it? I guess it'd be a gallon sized, um, plastic bag. You fill it with snow, you tie P cord around it, you bury that same as a good steak and it weighs almost nothing. Um, then the next morning you dig that back out and you pull it out. After that, I put the center spike of my pyramid in. I typically use, um, ski poles, um, because that's what I've got. Um, and I just don't want to carry any extra stuff. Um, and then typically I am putting Tyvek down, um, as a floor. Um, so put Tyvek down water moves one way in Tyvek. So just make sure you're putting it the right way down. And we've got two big sheets, my buddy and I, and, um, yeah, that's, that's what camp building looks like. Oh, and then we that. build walls. Uh, so you might, you might have to build walls as well. So if it's really windy, then you're getting back out and you're cutting walls with snow saws and then you're building three foot walls, depending on where the wind's coming from. And if it's really bad, you bury the edges of your snow or of your, your, um, your tarp. Uh, that are facing toward the wind to try to get that snow drift or spin drift from from blowing in. That's my process. Richard's description is about right. Like that is, it's it took him a couple minutes, but that is is a long time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, no, because it's that involved. It really is. Richard, what's your solution if you know you're going to get a couple inches of snow at night? What's your solution for the snow that's going to end up on your shelter? Where, what do you? How do you try to dispose of that? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is making sure you have a shelter that's going to be able to handle whatever is coming. So it's got, you need steep walled shelter, steep sides. Um, the, the more like traditional backpacking tents that are good three season or good in the summer are going to have flat places where snow can collect. And so pyramids are relatively steep. What I'm typically doing, if I'm getting a couple inches, just banging the sides off. If you're getting a lot, um, hopefully you put your, your tent in a place where it's not going to collect that, that much from the wind. And so you're just getting whatever's coming from the top, but you may have to get up in the middle of the night and clear the area around. Um, there's a certain degree to which the snow helps insulate your area, but there's also a degree to which the snow makes it so you cannot breathe. <laughs> so you really got to hit that sweet spot of breathing and also, um, not getting out of your uh, tent too often in the middle of the night. Snow coffin. <laughs> Um, other than a steep walled tent, any other considerations for choosing a four season tent for winter camping? Either of you? No, I think the, well, I think Richard's, I mean, that's, we both, we're both using the same sort of shelter because we're favoring, we're favoring the weight savings. Mm -hmm. We're basically trying to get the lightest shelter we can for something that is, is appropriate for that weather. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly, a, like a traditional four season tent with poles, I mean, that makes life a lot easier, way less fussy. Because like Richard, Richard knows how to set up his shelter really well. Um, but if if you struggle with it a little bit, like I mean, it's so much work to make sure that your that your corners are in the right places. So if you're not very good even in the summertime, where it's easy to move stakes around, it's way more work in the winter time to get those to get those corners in. And I, would, I would just say like for four season tents, you're getting a lot, you get a floor, you get this thing that just throws itself up. It's amazing. Um, they're really convenient. Um, I often find for the, the four season tents that I've used, they're not big enough for my actual use. They're basically, if you look at the black diamond first light or the MSR direct, I think is what it's called. Um, these are two man tents, quote unquote, but you are jammed in there. 
And so if you're getting into these big dome tents that you'll see in the ski movies, um, those things are weighing, or the Hillebergs, these are 8, 10, 12 pounds. Uh, you're also looking at $1,000 minimum for these things. Um, contrast that to the, the pyramid tent that I've got, which weighs under two pounds um, without all the guy lines I've added. And it costs about 300 to maybe $400 now. I don't, inflation. But, um, but there's... <laughs> Well, what's, what is yours made out of? Because that's actually a question down here. Nylon. Um, yeah. But that's because I can't afford the fancy Hyperlite one. If I could, I would have it immediately. Yeah. So there's this question about what type of um, tent material is best for winter. And I've only used nylons in, in the wintertime, mostly because that's when I did the bulk of my winter backpacking. And um, Rondell would tell you that, the, that you want a coated nylon for winter because the the snow slides off of it much easier. There's something about DCF or Cuban that like it's a little bit stickier, so the snow kind of globs onto it much more. But the thing that I love is that you can tighten that stuff and then it doesn't loosen. And if if it's getting soggy in the night, which it does, you really have to I mean I have a whole strategy with my tent where like I make sure I tent it I, I pitch it super loose and then I just like jam my arm through the corners and like tighten out each each corner at least once or twice a night if it's heavy snowfall. And the, otherwise you just get that stretch and then it starts getting really loud because the wind is whipping the thing around <laughs> and it's a it's a whole experience. Katie, I guess also, so, I don't know if this the paycheck is going this year. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I no. do want to back up and be like, we're talking about like some of the hardest core stuff that you can get into. I didn't just like immediately waltz into doing multi-day big like glacier traverses where I was getting like slammed by big storms. So if this sounds intimidating, there are ways to do it where you're still under tree line, and then a lot of what we're talking about is not coming into play. So, just to clarify. Do, okay, like, we've got a couple more. more. Oh, we, yeah. Yeah, we have a couple more minutes, but, but I'm just seeing some that I kind of like. So we'll try to we'll try to um, run through these quickly. So uh, there's this question about how to ha it says have your boots ever shrunk mid trip after getting soaked? I was once crippled by this, so I've been packing shoe trees ever since. So Richard, I don't know what your solution is, but my solution for 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 boots. Um, and, the, and, the, and the assumption here is a boot that actually could freeze. If you're using a ski boot with a, like a foam liner and a plastic shell, you're, you're, you don't have this issue. But if you're using a traditional waterproof, breathable, like more backpacking boot, um, or if you're using a, like a leather three pin telemark boot, then you definitely have a freezing issue. So the solution there is you, you pull into camp and you do all your things that Richard talked about earlier. And then your final thing is you, you basically sit down and you take your boot off and what you have to do is you open it up as much as you possibly can so you like pull that tongue out and you loosen up all the laces as much as you possibly can and then it's it's going to freeze overnight that's just like the way it is and then in the morning you shove your warm feet into your frozen cold boot and then you start breaking camp and you try to get out of there as quickly as you possibly can um, I have never, I, I don't think that there's another way to do it. You could, in theory, bring your boot into your sleeping bag with you, but <laughs> like, but it's wet, it's cold, it's like, it's, they're kind of big. Um, so I don't really think that that's a, a good solution. Um, if you get moving quickly in the morning, you'll be okay. It's not like the first 15 or 20 minutes really suck, but then you're moving. I would say avoiding all leather boots is kind of a big key here. Uh, and then the other thing is for me, I'm, I'm almost yeah. always in ski boots in the winter and I am taking those liners out and I'm sleeping with them in my sleeping bag um, because, yeah, the alternative is too brutal because just getting your feet back in those things when they're totally frozen is impossible. Um, so, yeah, I just sleep with them on. And then the trick to try to make sure my feet don't get too cold, especially in the early night, is using a hot water bottle to just keep things okay down there. Um, or you don't have to necessarily wear them. You just have them floating around in your big sleeping bag and you've got your down uh, booties on on your feet. Yep. Yep. Uh, current, um, there's a, what is your, which is your current favorite shoe for rugged off trail backpacking? That's actually more of a summer question. Andrew, these are question. under the not related to not this related topic. Not related to this section. topic. Are they, are yes, they we're ignoring those questions. Holy There's one in the up. chat from Shannon yeah. asking, how critical do you think avalanche level one training is for individuals who want to do um, winter backpacking? Richard, why don't you answer that and that'll be our yeah. last one for the night. Great. I can go on forever about this. Um, you really need to understand where you're going. 
if you were going somewhere in Virginia, no. But if you're going somewhere in the Cascades, yeah. And and just to be clear, I mean, I, I help teach these classes and I also was involved in a lot of stuff like this in Washington. Many, many different places are, are offering things called avalanche awareness classes. And basically these aren't gonna give you any certification or any real certain certainty about how avalanches work, but you will understand the parameters around them and when you should be worried about them and when you won't be. And I would really recommend trying to find a class like that, avalanche awareness. Um, there's also the, as you referenced, the ARI one, um, and, and that is kind of the standard for folks who are spending a lot of time in the backcountry or hoping to do a lot of backcountry skiing. Um, there's actually more and more folks who are moving into this online only space. So Mark Smiley, who's a really well-regarded mountain guide, has a thing called Mountain Sense, and he's actually teaching avalanche uh, courses online now. They're not the full thing. You actually have to add it to uh, an in-person like an in -person portion of that class. And so he's been partnering with different organizations to, to provide that. So you can do three quarters of the class online and then one quarter in person. Uh, but even just taking that on line would give you a better handle on where you might find avalanches and, and how to avoid them because it really is entirely terrain dependent. And I don't want to explain how all that works because it's complicated, but, um, it's another ask us anything. Yeah. I'll talk about that forever. <laughs> um, I would, the only thing I would add to that. So um, there's some great books out there. So like there's Bruce Tremper's like uh, stay yeah. safe and avalanche train. And I, I took an avalanche awareness course years ago. And I remember thinking like, like I basically learned everything in this course I learned in Bruce Tremper's book and it was a lot less expensive. But what I felt like I was missing from both experiences, just spending time on snow in avalanche train. And that is where if you are buddies with someone like Richard, that is where your knowledge base is going to take off because oh. you're, you're built, you're, you're learning from someone like him who spent a lot of time and developing, putting your own, layering your own experiences on top of that. So, okay, let's leave it at that. Um, thank you, Richard, for joining us tonight. Thanks, Katie, for moderating. Thanks, everyone, for um, for coming out. I'm not sure what the next Ask Us Anything will be, but we've been enjoying these um, these events, so we'll probably plan a couple more as well. Okay, have, have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone.